Hi, I'm Brother Dennis Loft, uh, a dollar soul brother from way back. Right, I was born in Melbourne, 1948. Um, I was the, the middle one of three boys and then a girl to follow. Right, born in, uh, we worked, we lived in the parish of uh, Ashburton, went to school there, and then uh, from there I went on to school at Dillsol Malvern. It was an interesting childhood, there were plenty of other children of our own age around, so families, we were often in many family groups and often did things together as different families. As I was growing up, I wasn't quite sure. I was quite good at schoolwork and uh, I gradually got more and more interested in a religious vocation, a priest at first, and then I thought I was impressed by the brothers as a community group. And uh, so uh, when I finished school, I went straight off to the, join the brothers. Um, and uh, really went straight off. Actually, I did the last two years with others who were interested in being brothers as well. And then from there, I went off and joined the brothers straight after school. Mum and Dad were both sort of professional people. Mum was a pharmacist and Dad was an engineer. So it was always expected that I'd um, go to university and do something in, in that line. Uh, so when I decided to be a brother, uh, my parents were quite happy with the decision. My grandfather, who was a, a mason, he wasn't particularly, um, and he tried to prevent it, but um, my parents were uh, solidly behind me. Well, I was always reasonably smart at school, never the top in the class, but you know, in the top half dozen or so. Um, I did work well, I stayed out of trouble mostly, wasn't particularly sporty, um, but not exactly a goody two-shoes, uh, but a little mischievous from time to time. But uh, I think mostly the teachers, uh, they got on well. The brothers particularly were the largest group of the teachers at that stage, generally. When I was at school, uh, you know, probably 80% of the teachers were brothers and the brothers had a good relationship with my parents as well. So um, I, I was a popular enough student amongst the students and also with the brothers. It was definitely the influence of the brothers themselves. At that stage, they were a very youngish, youngish group. They got on really well with each other. And I often recall you know, seeing them playing sports and games with each other after school and just thinking, how well they got on with each other. Uh, they're all good solid teachers as well. One, one particular brother, Jared Rumry, uh, a wonderful teacher, and he probably had more effects in, uh, more of an effect on me in terms of inspiring me to sort of follow suit. Currently, I'm very lucky. I retired and got bored with that. Uh, got a bad hip and uh, put in for a support role at St Bede's where I help kids with maths. Uh, then this year they were short of uh, a specialist maths teacher for one of the senior grades so they asked me to do that so I have all these really bright smart kids, small number of them, who are very intelligent right, uh, and enjoy maths right, uh, and it's a year 11 class so I don't have the trials of having to prepare them for the final exams or anything so we I have them once a day and that's a marvellous period. The rest of the time I spend um, taking kids who either don't enjoy maths or can't do it or need help. Uh, and uh, so I start, I do four days a week. Uh, Tuesdays I have often do bridge. When I went off to join the brothers, there were six others in my class that went off the same way. So it wasn't an uncommon practice. Um, of the six who went off, I'm the only one who stayed in the end, but it was uh, sort of an acceptable sort of a choice to make. These days for someone to leave and become a brother, it's so much a harder choice because there's not many others doing it in front of them or around them. Um, and had I come up in the same sort of circumstances as now, I don't know, I, I doubt whether the opportunity would have presented itself as easily. Have I regretted the choice I made? Uh, at times, sometimes I think of it, but basically no, I think um, it's been a good life. I've been very fortunate in the people who've been around me and the opportunities I've had and uh, the work I've been allowed to do with the brothers.
probably the worst period of my life was when I was finishing the second 10 years in Papua New Guinea. I'd had a stint in the first 10 years where I actually worked at the university and was doing social work, uh, a social work degree, and worked with um, kids 17, 18, 19, who hadn't had schooling and were living in the local settlements. And I had quite good contacts with people around the place and was able to to get jobs for them, to group work as, uh, you know, sort of youth work as a group and things like that. Now, 10 years later, these kids were 27, 28, 29, had their own families and uh, would come to me for help. And uh, so quite often they'd come and say, look, uh, we haven't got any food for tonight. Uh, can you help us? And I knew that if I did help them, they'd be there the next night with some mates and more of them coming. Uh, and uh, I just couldn't continue to, to help them. And I just felt quite uh, depressed by the whole situation. In fact, at the end, after that, it occurred for you know, about eight or nine months, I had a period of depression and actually left uh, Papua New Guinea for a couple of months, then went back for a year and then le finally left for good because just unable to sort of a whole uh, living has been one of giving and helping where possible and I was just not in a, a position to be able to assist at all and it was a really hard period for me in all sorts of ways. We did lots of things together we spent we had great holidays and things um, often running camps up in Queensland was one of the better sort of holidays we had as young brothers um, and uh, we we worked you know worked during holidays and um, by and large I didn't get into too much real trouble. You know, I've always had a, a penchant for a few beers and that now and then, but uh, mostly I've stayed out of mischief and stuff. Um, I do enjoy the surf, or I did. I've got a little old for that now, and the, the waves beat me. Um, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, Yes, <laughs> you can edit that. <laughs> I had two stints. Uh, Brother Bill Furman asked me to join him in uh, South Sudan. Well, the first time I volunteered myself and then did three years and thought, well, that's enough of that. And uh, came back to Australia and then after a year, Bill asked me to go back there again. Things weren't going well, the civil war had broken out. Uh, and those last three years in South Sudan were hard. Uh, there was a civil war around us. We weren't in any danger, but it was very hard to keep the program going. Um, the conditions were poor all the time, and while the civil war was on, they were even worse in terms of uh, getting things you really needed. Um, the lovely people to work with, but just very fierce conditions, and I got a fair bit of sickness and ill health there and finally gave up after three years. So that was probably the hardest place. I don't remember my first day as a teacher exactly, but I do remember my first day when I went to New Plymouth and um, uh, the first day of class when I started there and uh, the boss said, oh, um, uh, uh, you go and look after year seven. Now year seven, year six was the end of secondary, year seven were students who could go to, could have gone to university after year six, but if they stayed the next year, it was called a scholarship class they got automatic entry to universities and fees paid. So the brightest ones often stayed on for that. And I remember arriving in class there and sort of poking my head in the door. And these kids, first day back after the holidays, were chatting, chat, 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 and going on and on. And I sort of stamped my feet. Um, morning, fellas, morning. Um, I'm Brother Dennis, I'm the new teacher. And they turned around and said, yep, right. And off they turned around and back to the chats and things. <laughs> it was sort of hard to make an entry. <laughs> Well, I've had a, a few odd occasions getting started in class until you're known as always uh, a little bit intimidating sometimes you know making uh, your first entry. Would have to be um, what was a Holy Youth Development Centre in Port Moresby, now La Salle Technical College. It was a, a place I was asked to go to after I'd been my second lot of 10 years in, in uh, Papua New Guinea. And um, it was a school that the sisters had run and started for kids who couldn't get into high school. So to start with, it was grade six leavers. And then as 
more kids went to high school and became grade eight leavers. And um, it was all of the other teachers, there were about three or four brothers and three or four sisters as well. And the other teachers were all the best students that had gone through. Uh, so if a kid was good at woodwork, uh, really good at it, he stayed on and taught the others. Um, so we had about eight or nine other graduates from the school who were the other teachers. And uh, they were lovely kids to work with, um, great spirit in the place, um, and a uh, really pleasant time to work there. That was during the 90s. Well, Jared Rumry taught me when I was in about year nine and 10. Uh, mainly English is what I, the subject I remember him teaching me, although I think he also taught French, uh, but he was just such a genuine person, such a good teacher, so well prepared. And uh, he taught poetry, which I absolutely hate, but um, he made it live and uh, enjoyable and Shakespeare and things like that, which I'm not a, a good English literature person generally, but um, just his whole approach to teaching and his uh, warmth with all the students, uh, a great um, role model for me. And then I met him later again when I was in the Scholastic and he was transferred there and taught, taught us again there and been a great influence many times during my life. I remember uh, prior to making first vows, um, uh, just at the end of the mission, having quite an unusual experience. I was just out by myself in the middle of the night under the stars um, late at night and um, just feeling uh, this all-encompassing presence of God around me and sort of reminding myself at that stage that oh, shit, this isn't what, I mean, golly gosh, this isn't what normally happens. Uh, this isn't what normally happens. So um, I remember thinking, you know, I, I need to treasure a moment like this. And it happened once or two, once particularly again, again when I was on a retreat at Naruma, um, some this rather, rather weird experience of feeling very, very close to God. Um, other times, like I, I put off um, making final vows for a long time till, till the last moment, till I was 28. Normally you could make them from the time you're about 25. Um, and uh, because I was just unsure that I could make a commitment for life. Uh, and I remember um, Brother Rayfield Bassett was the one um, chatting with me and said, look, we're always going to have a, a certain degree of um, uh, unbelief or a certain degree of uh, worry about whether the choice we make is right or wrong. And all you can go on is what, you're, what you are at, at present, right? Things may change in the future. And he gave me enough, um, uh, enough faith, I suppose, to be able to sort of say, well, this has been a good life for me now and I'll make a commitment for it for the future. And I've had doubts from time to time, but by and large, it's worked out well. Why do things change so much? You know, why can't they be a bit more the same? I suppose as you get older, you look forward to a bit more stability and things going the direction you want. When you're younger, you want things to be uh, increasing and you know variety and everything, uh, but it just it's harder and harder to settle into a routine or something. Now I'm not sure what question I want to ask God. Uh, you know, why, why are some people nasty to other people? I'd like to be remembered as a, a good person, uh, someone who didn't upset too many people, uh, someone that was able to offer some guidance to some people in their lives uh, and to bring a bit of cheer into some people's lives. I've enjoyed my time working particularly in uh, societies that have a lot less than I have. And um, I've, I've gained a lot from that. And I hope what the time I've spent there has been helpful to those sorts of people particularly. I actually have a student at St. Beads is thinking of it. And it's, it's a hard advice to, to know what to do. I've advised him to, you know, really think carefully, pray about it, and to keep all options open, right? Don't close yourself down quickly. Uh, don't make a decision before you have to make a decision. Um, so 
I've tried to advise him, you know, go on to university, right, and live uh, and be involved in, to, in as many things as you possibly can and keep as many options open as you can so you don't have to make a decision too quickly. Well, I think we've got a good summary in that, in the, that uh, the youth group and a few others have taken out more out recently with FSC. And I think that faith, service and community are a very good summary of what our life is about. You know, it's important to have some sort of relationship with God that gives our life a direction, right? That we have a good relationship with others as well through service of them. Um, we've always been a group that uh, does something that works with people to try and make other people's lives better and working with um, those who aren't as fortunate as ourselves. And then the last bit is we do it by being in community with a few close people that, that help us not focus just on ourselves, but um, help us bear witness to something that's bigger than ourselves. So I think that faith, service and community is a good sort of summary of what the Lasallian vocation is. Thank you.